Chapter 13 My body reacts before my mind does and I'm running out the door across the lawns of the Victor's Village into the dark beyond. Moisture from the sodden ground soaks my socks and I'm aware of the sharp bite of the wind, but I don't stop. Where? Where to go? The woods, of course. I'm at the fence before the hum makes me remember how very trapped I am. I back away, panting, turn on my heel and take off again. The next thing I know I'm on my hands and knees in the cellar of one of the empty houses in the Victor's village. Faint shafts of moonlight come in through the window wells above at my head. I'm cold and wet and winded, but my escaped attempt has done nothing to subdue the hysteria rising up inside of me. It will drown me unless it's released. I ball up the front of my shirt, stuff it into my mouth, and begin to scream. How long this continues, I don't know, but when I stop, my voice is almost gone. I curl up on my side and stare at the patches of moonlight on the cement floor. Back in the arena. Back in the place of nightmares. That is where I'm going. I have to admit I didn't see it coming. I saw a multitude of other things, being publicly humiliated, tortured, and executed. Fleeing through the wilderness, pursued by peacekeepers and hovercraft, marriage to PETA with our children forced into the arena, but never that I, myself, would have to be a player in the games again. Why? Because there's no precedent for it. Victors are out of the reaping for life. That's the deal if you win. Until now. There's some kind of sheeting. The kind they put down when they paint. I pull it over me like a blanket. In the distance, someone is calling my name, but at the moment, I excuse myself from thinking about even those I love the most. I think only of me. What lies ahead? The sheeting's stiff but holds warmth. My muscles relax and my heart rate slows. I see the wooden box in the little boy's hands, President Snow drawing out the yellowed envelope. Is it possible that this was really the quarter quell written down 75 years ago? It seems unlikely. It's just too perfect an answer for the troubles that face the capital today. Getting rid of me and subduing the districts all in one neat little package. I can hear President Snow's voice in my head. On the 75th anniversary, as a reminder to the rebels that even the strongest among them cannot overcome the power of the capital, the male and female tributes will be reaped from their existing pool of victors. Yes, our victors are the strongest. They're the ones who survived the arena and slipped the noose of poverty that strangles the rest of us. They, or I should say we, are the very embodiment of hope where there is no hope. And now 23 of us will be killed to show how even that hope is an illusion. I'm glad I won only last year. Otherwise, I'd know all the other victors, not just because I see them on television, but because they're guests at every games. Even if they're not mentoring like Hamish always has to, most return to the capital each year for the event. I think a lot of them are friends, whereas the only friend I have to worry about killing will be either Peta or Hamish. Peta or Hamish. I sit straight up, throwing off the sheeting. What just went through my mind? There's no situation in which I would ever kill Peta or Hamish. But one of them will be in the arena with me, and that is a fact. They may have even decided between them who it will be. Whoever is picked first, the other will have the option of volunteering to take his place. I already know what will happen. Peta will ask Hamish to let him go into the arena with me no matter what, for my sake, to protect me. I stumble around the cellar looking for an exit. How did I even get into this place? I, I feel my way up through the steps of the kitchen and see the glass window and the door that has been shattered. Maybe that's why my hands seem to be bleeding. I hurry back into the night and head straight to Hamish's house. He's sitting alone at his kitchen table, a half-emptied bottle of white liquor in one fist, his knife in the other. Drunk as a skunk. Ah, there she is, all tuckered out. Finally did the math, did you, sweetheart? Worked out you won't be going in alone. And now you're here to ask me... What? He says. I don't answer. The window's wide open and the wind cuts through me just as if I were outside. I'll admit it was easier for the boy. He was here before I could snap the seal on a bottle. Begging for another chance to go in, but... 
what can you say? Take my place, Hamish, because all the things being equal, I'd rather Peter have a crack at the rest of his life than you. I bite my lip, because once he said it, I'm afraid that that's what I do want, for Peter to live, even if it means Hamish's death. No, I, I don't. That's dreadful, of course, but Hamish is my family now. What did I come for, I think? What could I possibly want here? I came for a drink, I say. Hamish bursts out laughing and slams the bottle on the table before me. I run my sleeve across the top and take a couple gulps before I come up choking. It takes a few minutes to compose myself, and even though my eyes and nose are streaming. But inside me, the liquor feels like fire and I like it. Maybe it should be you, I say matter-of-factly as I pull up a chair. You hate life anyway. Very true. And since last time I tried keeping you alive... Seems like I'm obligated to save the boy this time. That's another good point, I say, wiping my nose and tipping the bottle again. Peter's argument is that since I chose you, now I owe him anything he wants. And what he wants is the chance to go in again to protect you. I knew it. In this way, Peta is not hard to predict. While I was wallowing around on the floor of that cellar, thinking only of myself, he was here, thinking only of me. Shame isn't a strong enough word for what I feel. You could live a hundred lifetimes and not deserve him, you know? Yeah, yeah, I say brusquely. No question, he's the superior one of this trio, so what are you going to do? I don't know. Go back in with you, maybe, if I can. If my name's drawn at the reaping, it won't matter. I'll just volunteer and take my place. We sit for a while in silence. It'll be bad for you in the arena, won't it? Knowing all the others, I ask. Oh, I think we can count on it being unbearable wherever I am. He nods at the bottle. Can I have that back now? No, I say, wrapping my arms around it. Hamish pulls another bottle out from under the table and gives the top a twist. But I realize I'm not just here for a drink. There's something else I want from Hamish. Okay, I figured out what I'm asking, I say. If it's Peta and me in the games, this time I want you to try to keep him alive. Something flickers across his bloodshot eyes. Pain. Like you said, it's going to be bad no matter how you slice it. And whatever Peta wants, it's his turn to be saved. We both owe him that. My voice takes a pleading tone. Besides, the Capitol hates me so much I'm as good as dead now. He still might have a chance. Please, Hamish, say you'll help me. He frowns at his bottle, weighing my words. All right, he says finally. Thanks, I say. I should go see Peter now, but I don't want to. My head's spinning from the drink, and I'm so wiped out. Who knows what he could get me to agree to? No, now I have to get home to face my mother in Prim. As I stagger up the steps to my house, the front door opens and Gail pulls me into his arms. I was wrong. I should have gone when you said. He whispers. No. I say. I'm having trouble focusing, and the liquor keeps sloshing out of my bottle and down the back of Gail's jacket, but he doesn't seem to care. It's not too late. He says. Over his shoulder, I see my mother and Prim clutching each other in the doorway. We run, they die. And now I've got Peter to protect. End of discussion. Yeah, it is. My knees give way, and he's holding me up. As the alcohol overcomes my mind, I hear the glass bottle shatter on the floor. This seems appropriate, since I've obviously lost my grip on everything. When I wake up, I barely get to the toilet before the white liquor makes its reappearance. It burns just as much coming up as it did going down and tastes twice as bad. I'm trembling and sweaty when I finish vomiting, but at least most of the stuff is out of my system. Enough made it into my bloodstream, though, to result in a pounding headache, parched mouth, and boiling stomach. I turn on the shower and stand under the warm rain for a minute before I realize I'm still in my underclothes. My mother must have just stripped off my filthy outer ones and tucked me into bed. I throw the wet undergarments in the sink and pour shampoo on my head. My hands sting, and that's when I notice the stitches, small and even, across one palm and up the side of my other hand. Vaguely, I remember breaking the glass of the window last night. I scrub myself from head to toe, only stopping to throw up again in the shower. 
It's mostly just bile that goes down the drain with the sweet smelling bubbles. Finally clean, I pull on my robe and head back into bed, ignoring my dripping hair. I climb under the blankets, sure this is what it must feel like to be poisoned. The footsteps on the stairs renew my panic from last night. I'm not ready to see my mother in prim. I have to pull myself together to be calm and reassuring, the way I was when we said our goodbyes the day of the last reaping. I have to be strong. I struggle into an upright position, push my wet hair off my throbbing temples, and brace myself for this meeting. They appear in the doorway, holding the tea and toast, their faces filled with concern. I open my mouth, planning to start off with some kind of joke, and burst into tears. So much for being strong. My mother sits on one side of the bed, and Prim crawls right up next to me, and they hold me, making quiet, soothing sounds until I'm mostly cried out. Then Prim gets a towel and dries my hair, combing out the knots while my mother coaxes tea and toast in me. They dress me in warm pajamas and layer more blankets on me until I drift off again. I can tell by the light it's late afternoon when I come round again. There's a glass of water on my bedside table and I gulp it down thirstily. My stomach and head still feel rocky, but much better than they did earlier. I rise, dress, and braid back my hair. Before I go down, I pause at the top of the stairs, feeling slightly embarrassed about the way I've handled the news of the quarter quell. My erratic flight, drinking with Hamish, weeping. Given the circumstances, I guess I deserve one day of indulgence. I'm glad the cameras weren't there for it, though. Downstairs, my mother and Prim embrace me again, but they're not overly emotional. I know they're holding things in to make it easier for me. Looking at Prim's face, it's hard to imagine she's the same frail little girl I left behind on the reaping day nine months ago. The combination of that ordeal and all that has followed, the cruelty in the district, the parade of the sick and wounded that, that she often treats by herself now, if my mother's hands are too full. These things have aged her years. She's grown quite a bit, too. We're practically the same height now, but that isn't what makes her seem so much older. My mother ladles a mug of broth for me, and I ask for a second mug to take to Hamish, Then I walk across the lawn to his house. He's only just waking up and accepts the mug without comment. We sit there, almost peacefully, sipping our broth and watching the sun set through his living room window. I hear someone walking up the stairs, and I assume it's Hazel, but a few minutes later, Peta comes down and tosses a cardboard box of empty liquor bottles on the table with finality. There. It's done. What's done? I've poured all the liquor down the drain. Tossed the lot, says Peta. This seems to jolt Hamage out of his stupor, and he paws through the box in disbelief. He'll just buy more. No, he won't. I tracked down Ripper this morning and told her I'd turn her in the second she sold to either of you. I paid her off, too, just for good measure, but I don't think she's eager to be back in the peacekeeper's custody. Hamish takes a swipe with his knife, but Peter deflects it so easily it's pathetic. Anger rises up in me. What business is it of yours what he does? It's completely my business. However it falls out, two of us are going to be in the arena again with the other as mentor. We can't afford any drunkards on the team. Especially not you, Katniss. What?! Last night's the only time I've ever been drunk. Yeah, and look at the shape you're in. I don't know what I expected from my first meeting with Peta after the announcement. A few hugs and kisses, a little comfort maybe. Not this. I turn to Hamish. Don't worry, I'll get you more liquor. Then I'll turn you both in. Let you sober up in the stocks. What is the point of the this? The point is that two of us are coming home from the capital. One mentor and one victor. Effie's sending me recordings of all of the living victors. We're going to watch their games and learn everything we can about how they fight. We are going to put on weight and get strong. We're going to start acting like careers. And one of us is going to be Victor again, whether you two like it or not. He sweeps out of the room, slamming the front door. Hamish and I wince at the bang. I don't like self-righteous people. What is there to like? Says Hamish, who begins to suck the dregs out of the empty bottles. You and me. That's who he plans on coming home, I say. Well, then the joke's on him. But after a few days, we agree to act like careers, because that's the best way to get Peter ready as well. Every night, we watch old recaps of the games that the remaining victors won. I realize that we've never met any of them on the victory tour, which seems odd in retrospect. When I bring it up, Hamish says the last thing President Snow would have wanted was to show Peter and me, especially me, bonding with the other victors and potentially rebellious districts. Victors have a special status, 
and if they appeared to be supporting my defiance of the capital, it would have been dangerous politically. Adjusting for age, I realize some of our opponents may be elderly, which is both sad and reassuring. PETA takes copious notes, Hamish volunteers information about the victors' personalities, and slowly we begin to know our competition. Every morning we do exercises to strengthen our bodies. We run and lift things and stretch our muscles. Every afternoon we work on combat skills, throwing knives, fighting hand to hand. I even teach them to climb trees. Officially, tributes aren't supposed to train, but no one tries to stop us. Even in regular years, the tributes from districts 1, 2, and 4 show up able to wield spears and swords. This is nothing by comparison. After all the years of abuse, Hamish's body resists improvement. He's still remarkably strong, but even the shortest run wins him. And you'd think a guy who sleeps every night with a knife might actually be able to hit the side of a house with one, but his hands shake so badly that it takes weeks for him to even achieve that. Peta and I excel under the new regimen, though. It gives me something to do. It gives us all something to do besides accept defeat. My mother puts us on a special diet to gain weight. Prim treats our sore muscles. Madge sneaks us her father's capitals newspapers. Predictions on who will be the victor of the victors show us among the favorites. Gail steps into the picture on Sundays, although he's got no love for Peter or Hamish and teaches us all he knows about snares. It's weird for me, being in conversations with both Peter and Gail, but they seem to have set aside whatever issues they have about me. One night, as I'm walking Gail back into town, he even admits, It'd be better if he were easier to hate. Tell me about it. If I could have just hated him in the arena, we all wouldn't be in this mess now. He'd be dead, and I'd be a happy little victor all by myself. And where would we be, Katniss? I pause, not knowing what to say. Where would I be with my pretend cousin who wouldn't be my cousin if it weren't for Peta? Would he still have kissed me, and would I have kissed him back? had I been free to do so? Would I have let myself open up to him, lulled by the security of money and food and the illusion of safety, being a victor who could bring us under cir- different circumstances? But there would always still be the reaping looming over us, over our children, no matter what I wanted. Hunting, like every Sunday. I know he didn't mean the question literally, but this is as much as I can give, honestly. Gail knows I chose him over Peter when I didn't make a run for it. To me, there's no point in talking about things that might have been. Even if I had killed Pete in the arena, I still wouldn't have wanted to marry anyone. I only got engaged to save people's lives, and it completely backfired. I'm afraid, anyway, that any kind of emotional scene with Gail might cause him to do something drastic. Like, start that uprising in the mines. And, as Hamish says, District 12 isn't ready for that. If anything, they're less than ready than before the quarter quell announcement, because the following morning another hundred peacekeepers arrived on the train. Since I don't plan on making it back alive a second time, the sooner Gail lets me go, the better. I do plan on saying one or two things to him after the reaping, when we're allowed an hour for goodbyes, to let Gail know how essential he's been to me all these years, how much better my life has been for knowing him, for loving him, even if it's only a limited way I can manage. But I never get the chance. The day of the reaping is hot and sultry. The population of District 12 waits sweating and silent in the square with machine guns trained on them. I stand alone in a small roped-off area with Peta and Hamich in a similar pen to the right of me. The reaping takes only a minute. Effie, shining in a wig of metallic gold, lacks her usual verve. She has to claw around the girl's reaping ball for quite a while to snag that one piece of paper everyone already knows has my name on it. Then she catches Hamish's name. He barely has time to shoot me an unhappy look before Peta has volunteered to take his place. We are immediately marched into the Justice Building to find Ped Peacekeeper Thread waiting for us. New procedure, he says with a smile. We're ushered out the back door into a car and taken to the train station. There are no cameras on the platform, no crowd to send us on our way. Hamish and Effie appear, escorted by guards. Peacekeepers hurry us all onto the train and slam the door. The wheels begin to turn and I'm left staring out the window, watching District 12 appear, with all of my goodbyes still hanging on my lips.